Recording by John Greenman. Anti Imperialist Writings by Mark Twain. King Leopold's Soliloquy, Part Two. A Tsar, nineteen o five. A pasteboard autocrat, a despot out of date, a fading planet in the glare of day, a flickering candle in the bright sun's ray, burnt to the socket, fruit left too late, high on a blighted bough, ripe till it's rotten by god forsaken and by time forgotten watching the crumbling edges of his lands a spineless god to whom dumb millions pray from finland in the west to far cathay lord of a frost-bound continent he stands her seeming ruin his dim mind appalls and in the frozen stupor of his sleep he hears dull thunders pealing as she falls and mighty fragments dropping in the deep. Note. B. H. Nadal in the New York Times. End of note. It is fine. One is obliged to concede it. It is a great picture and impressive. The mongrel handles his pen well. Still, with opportunity, I would cruci— uh, flay him. A spineless god. It is the czar to a dot. A god and spineless a royal invertebrate poor lad soft-hearted and out of place a spineless god to whom dumb millions pray remorselessly correct concise too and compact the soul and spirit of the human race compressed into half a sentence on their knees one hundred and forty million on their knees to a little tin deity massed together they would stretch away and away and away across the plains fading and dimming and failing in a measureless perspective why even the telescope's vision could not reach to the final frontier of that continental spread of human servility now why should a king value the respect of the human race it is quite unreasonable to expect it a curious race certainly it finds fault with me and with my occupations and forgets that neither of us could exist an hour without its sanction it is our confederate and all-powerful protector it is our bulwark our friend our fortress for this it has our gratitude our deep and honest gratitude but not our respect let it snivel and fret and grumble if it likes that is all right we do not mind that turns over leaves of a scrapbook pausing now and then to read a clipping and make a comment the poets how they do hunt that poor czar french germans english americans they all have a bark at him the finest and capablest of the pack and the fiercest are swilburne english i think and a pair of americans thomas bailey eldridge and colonel richard waterson gilder of the sentimental periodical called century magazine and louisville courier journal they certainly have uttered some very strong yelps i can't seem to find them i must have mislaid them if a poet's bite were as terrible as his bark why dear me but it isn't a wise king minds neither of them but the poet doesn't know it it's a case of little dog and lightning express when the czar goes thundering by the poet skips out and rages alongside for a little distance then returns to his kennel wagging his head with satisfaction and thinks he has inflicted a memorable scare whereas nothing has really happened the czar didn't know he was around they never bark at me i wonder why that is i suppose my corruption department buys them that must be it for certainly i ought to inspire a bark or two i'm rather choice material i should say why here is a yelp at me mumbling a poem what gives thee holy right to murder hope and water ignorance with human blood from what high universe dividing power drawst thou thy wondrous ripe brutality oh horrible 
thou god who seest these things help us to blot this terror from the earth no i see it is to the czar note lewis morgan sill in harper's weekly End of note. after all but there are those who would say it fits me and rather snugly too ripe brutality they would say the czar's isn't ripe yet but that mine is and not merely ripe but rotten nothing could keep them from saying that they would think it smart this terror let the czar keep that name i am supplied this long time i have been the monster that was their favorite the monster of crime but now i have a new one they have found a fossil dinosaur fifty-seven feet long and sixteen feet high and set it up in the museum in new york and labeled it leopold the second but it is no matter one does not look for manners in a republic mm, that reminds me i have never been caricatured could it be that the corsairs of the pencil could not find an offensive symbol that was big enough and ugly enough to do my reputation justice after reflection there is no other way i will buy the dinosaur and suppress it rests himself with some more chapter headings reads more mutilation of children hands cut off testimony of american missionaries evidence of british missionaries it's all the same old thing tedious repetitions and duplications of shop-worn episodes mutilations murders massacres and so on and so on till one gets drowsy over it mr morell intrudes at this point and contributes a comment which he could just as well have kept to himself and throws in some italics of course these people can never get along without italics it is one heart-rending story of human misery from beginning to end and it is all recent meaning 1904 and 1905 i do not see how a person can act so this morale is a king's subject and reverence for monarchy should have restrained him from reflecting upon me with that exposure this morel is a reformer a congo reformer that sizes him up he publishes a sheet in liverpool called the west african mail which is supported by the voluntary contributions of the sap-headed and soft-hearted and every week it steams and reeks and festers with up-to-date congo atrocities of the sort detailed in this pile of pamphlets here i will suppress it i suppressed a congo atrocity book there after it was actually in print it should not be difficult for me to suppress a newspaper studies some photographs of mutilated negroes throws them down sighs the kodak has been a sore calamity to us the most powerful enemy that has confronted us indeed in the early years we had no trouble in getting the press to expose the tales of the mutilations as slanders lies inventions of busybody american missionaries and exasperated foreigners who had found the open door of the berlin congo charter closed against them when they innocently went out there to trade and by the press's help we got the christian nations everywhere to turn an irritated and unbelieving ear to those tales and say hard things about the tellers of them yes all things went harmoniously and pleasantly in those good days and i was looked up to as the benefactor of a downtrodden and friendless people then all of a sudden came the crash that is to say the incorruptible kodak and all the harmony went to hell the only witness i have encountered in my long experience that i couldn't bribe every yankee missionary and every interrupted trader sent home and got one and now oh well the pictures get sneaked around everywhere in spite of all we can do to ferret them out and suppress them ten thousand pulpits and ten thousand presses 
are saying the good word for me all the time and placidly and convincingly denying the mutilations then that trivial little kodak that a child can carry in its pocket gets up uttering never a word and knocks them dumb what is this fragment reads but enough of trying to tally off his crimes his list is interminable we should never get to the end of it his awful shadow lies across his congo free state and under it an unoffending nation of fifteen million is withering away and swiftly succumbing to their miseries it is a land of graves it is the land of graves it is the congo free graveyard it is a majestic thought that is this ghastliest episode in all human history is the work of one man alone one solitary man just a single individual leopold king of the belgians he is personally and solely responsible for all the myriad crimes that have blackened the history of the congo state he is sole master there he is absolute he could have prevented the crimes by his mere command he could stop them to-day with a word he withholds the word for his pocket's sake it seems strange to see a king destroying a nation and laying waste a country for mere sordid money's sake and solely and only for that lust of conquest is royal kings have always exercised that stately vice we are used to it by old habit we condone it perceiving a certain dignity in it but lust of money lust of shillings lust of nickels lust of dirty coin not for the nation's enrichment but for the king's alone this is new it distinctly revolts us we cannot seem to reconcile ourselves to it we resent it we despise it we say it is shabby unkingly out of character being democrats we ought to jeer and jest we ought to rejoice to see the purple dragged in the dirt but well account for it as we may we don't we see this awful king this pitiless and blood-drenched king this money-crazy king towering toward the sky in a world solitude of sordid crime unfellowed and apart from the human race sole butcher for personal gain findable in all his caste ancient or modern pagan or christian proper and legitimate target for the scorn of the lowest and the highest and the execrations of all who hold in cold esteem the oppressor and the coward and well it is a mystery but we do not wish to look for he is a king and it hurts us it troubles us by ancient and inherited instinct it shames us to see a king degraded to this aspect and we shrink from hearing the particulars of how it happened we shudder and turn away when we come upon them in print why certainly that is my protection and you will continue to do it i know the human race an original mistake this work of civilization is an enormous and continual butchery all the facts we brought forward in this chamber were denied at first most energetically but later little by little they were proved by documents and by official texts the practice of cutting off hands is said to be contrary to instructions but you are content to say that indulgence must be shown and that this bad habit must be corrected little by little and you plead moreover that only the hands of fallen enemies are cut off and that if hands are cut off enemies not quite dead and who after recovery have had the bad taste to come to the missionaries and show them their stumps it was due to an original mistake in thinking that they were dead from debate in belgian parliament july nineteen o three supplementary since the first edition of this pamphlet was issued the congo story has entered upon a new chapter the king's commission concedes the correctness of the delineation contained in the foregoing pages 
it affirms the prevalence of frightful abuses under the king's rule for eight months the king held back the report but his commissioners had been too deeply moved by the horrors unfolded before them in their visit to the congo state and the testimony presented to them had reached the world through other sources the digest of the report as forwarded from brussels to the european and american press was skillfully edited and the report itself does its best to gloss over the king's responsibility for the shame but the story told in the genuine document is essentially as hideous as anything found in the depositions of plain speaking missionaries so the facts are clear indisputable undisputed the train of revilers of missionary testimony whose roseate pictures of conditions under the king's rule have beguiled the uninformed hurries out at the wings and leopold is left to hold the stage with a skeleton that refuses longer to stay hidden in his congo closet one thing the report omits to do it does not brand or judge the system out of which the foul breed of iniquities has sprung the king's claim to personal ownership of eight hundred thousand square miles of territory with all their products and his employment of savage hordes to realize on his claim judgment of this policy the commission holds to be beyond its function being thus disqualified for striking at the roots of the enormity the commissioners propose such superficial reforms as occur to them and the king hastens to take up with their suggestion by calling to his assistance in the work of reform a new commission of this body of fourteen members all but two are committed by their past record to defence and maintenance of the king's congo policy so ends the king's investigation of himself doubtless less jubilantly than he had planned but withal as ineffectively as it was foredoomed to end one stage is achieved the next in order is action by the powers responsible for the existence of the congo state the united states is one of these such procedure is advocated in petitions to the president and congress signed by john wanamaker lyman abbott henry van dyke david starr jordan and many other leading citizens if ever the sisterhood of civilized nations have occasion to go up to the hague or some other accessible meeting-place a foreordained hour for their assembling has now struck some things the report of the king's commission says apart from the rough plantations which barely suffice to feed the natives themselves and to supply the stations all the fruits of the soil are considered as the property of the state or of the concessionaire societies it has even been admitted that on the land occupied by them the natives cannot dispose of the produce of the soil except to the extent in which they did so before the constitution of the state each official in charge of a station or agent in charge of a factory claimed from the natives without asking himself on what grounds the most diverse imposts in labor or in kind either to satisfy his own needs and those of his station or to exploit the riches of the domain the agents themselves regulated the tax and saw to its collection and had a direct interest in increasing its amount since they received proportional bonuses on the produce thus collected missionaries both catholic and protestant whom we heard at leopoldville were unanimous in accentuating the general wretchedness existing in the region one of them said that this system which compels the natives to feed three thousand workmen at leopoldville will if continued for another five years wipe out the population of the district judicial officials have informed us of the sorry consequences of the porterage system it exhausts the unfortunate people subjected to it and threatens them with partial destruction in the majority of cases the native must go one or two days march every fortnight until he arrives at that part of the forest where the rubber vines can be met with in a certain degree of abundance there the collector passes a number of days in a miserable existence he has to build himself an improvised shelter which cannot obviously replace his hut he has not the food to which he is accustomed 
he is deprived of his wife exposed to the inclemencies of the weather and the attacks of wild beasts when once he has collected the rubber he must bring it to the state station or to that of the company and only then can he return to his village where he can sojourn for barely more than two or three days because the next demand is upon him it was barely denied that in the various posts of the a b i r which we visited the imprisonment of women hostages the subjection of the chiefs to servile labor the humiliations meted out to them the flogging of rubber collectors the brutality of the black employees set over the prisoners were the rule commonly followed according to the witnesses these auxiliaries especially those stationed in the villages convert themselves into despots claiming the women and the food they kill without pity all those who attempt to resist their whims the truth of the charges is borne out by a mass of evidence and official reports the consequences are often very murderous and one must not be astonished if in the course of these delicate operations whose object it is to seize hostages and to intimidate the natives constant watch cannot be exercised over the sanguinary instincts of the soldiers when orders to punish are given by superior authority it is difficult to prevent the expedition from degenerating into massacres accompanied by pillage and incendiarism the united states government and the congo state the international association of the congo was recognized by the united states april twenty two eighteen eighty four nine months afterward recognition was secured from germany and later successively from the other european powers two international conferences were held at which the powers constituted themselves guardians of the people of the congo territory the association binding itself to regard the principles of administration adopted in both these conferences the united states government prominently participated the act of berlin was not submitted by the president of the united states for ratification by the senate because its adoption as a whole was thought by him to involve responsibility for support of the territorial claims of rival powers in the congo region the act of brussels with a proviso safeguarding this point was formally ratified by the united states senate whether we are without obligation to reach a hand to this expiring people the intelligent reader will judge for himself stanley saw neither fortress nor flag of any civilization save that of the united states which he carried along the arterial watercourse the first appeal for recognition and for moral support was naturally and justly made to the government whose flag was first carried across the region mr Cason, in the north american review february eighteen eighty six this government at the outset testified its lively interest in the well-being and future progress of the vast region now committed to your majesty's wise care by being the first among the powers to recognize the flag of the international association of the congo as that of a friendly state president cleveland to king leopold september eleventh eighteen eighty five the recognition by the united states was the birth into new life of the association seriously menaced as its existence was by opposing interests and ambitions mr stanley the congo volume one page three hundred eighty three he the president of the united states desires to see in the delimitation of the region which shall be subjected to this beneficent rule of the international association of the congo the widest expansion consistent with the just territorial rights of other governments address of mr Cason, u s representative at berlin conference eighteen eighty four so marked was the acceptance by the berlin conference of the views presented on the part of the united states that herr von bunsen reviewing the action of the conference assigns after germany the first place of influence in the conference to the united states mr Cason, in north american review february eighteen eighty six in sending a representative to this assembly the government of the united states 
has wished to show the great interest and deep sympathy it feels in the great work of philanthropy which the conference seeks to realize our country must feel beyond all others an immense interest in the work of this assembly mr terrell u s representative at brussels conference first session november nineteen eighteen eighty nine mr terrell informs the conference that he has been authorized by his government to sign the general act adopted by the conference the president says that the u s minister's communication will be received by the conference with extreme satisfaction records of brussels conference june twenty eighth eighteen ninety claiming as at berlin to speak in the name of almighty god the signatories at brussels declared themselves to be equally animated by the firm intention of putting an end to the crimes and devastations engendered by the traffic in african slaves of protecting effectually the aboriginal populations and of ensuring the benefits of peace and civilization civilization in congoland h r fox bourne the president continues to hope that the government of the united states which was the first to recognize the congo free state will not be one of the last to give it the assistance of which it may stand in need remarks of belgian president of brussels conference session may fourteenth eighteen ninety ought king leopold to be hanged note the above article which came to hand as the foregoing was in press is commended to the king and to the readers of his soliloquy m t interview by mr w t stead with the rev john h harris baringa congo state in the english review of reviews for september nineteen o five for the somewhat startling suggestion in the heading of this interview the missionary interviewed is in no way responsible the credit of it or if you like the discredit belongs entirely to the editor of the review who without dogmatism wishes to pose the question as a matter for serious discussion since charles the first's head was cut off opposite whitehall nearly two hundred and fifty years ago the sanctity which doth hedge about a king has been held in slight and scant regard by the puritans and their descendants hence there is nothing antecedently shocking or outrageous in the discussion of the question whether the acts of any sovereign are such as to justify the calling in of the services of the public executioner it is not of course for a journalist to pronounce judgment but no function of the public writer is so imperative as that of calling attention to great wrongs and no duty is more imperious than that of insisting that no rank or station should be allowed to shield from justice the real criminal when he is once discovered the controversy between the congo reform association and the emperor of the congo has now arrived at a stage in which it is necessary to take a further step toward the redress of unspeakable wrongs and the punishment of no less unspeakable criminals the rev j h harris an english missionary has lived for the last seven years in that region of central africa the upper congo which king leopold has made over to one of his vampire groups of financial associates known as the a b i r society on the strictly business basis of a half share in the profits wrung from the blood and misery of the natives he has now returned to england and last month he called at marlbury house to tell me the latest from the congo mr harris is a young man in a dangerous state of volcanic fury and no wonder after living for seven years face to face with the devastations of the vampire state it is impossible to deny that he does well to be angry when he began as is the wont of those who have emerged from the depths to detail horrifying stories of murder the outrage and torture of women the mutilation of children and the whole infernal category of horrors served up with a background of cannibalism sometimes voluntary and sometimes incredible though it seems enforced by the orders of the officers i cut him short and said dear mr harris 
as in oriental despatches the india office translator abbreviates the first page of the letter into two words after compliments or a c so let us abbreviate our conversation about the congo by the two words after atrocities or a a they are so invariable and so monotonous as lord percy remarked in the house the other day that it is unnecessary to insist upon them there is no longer any dispute in the mind of any reasonable person as to what is going on in the congo it is the economical exploitation of half a continent carried on by the use of armed force wielded by officials the aim all and be all of whose existence is to extort the maximum amount of rubber in the shortest possible time in order to pay the largest possible dividend to the holders of shares in the concessions well said mr harris reluctantly for he is so accustomed to speaking to persons who require to be told the whole dismal tale from a to z what is it you want to know i want to know i said whether you consider the time is ripe for summoning king leopold before the bar of an international tribunal to answer for the crimes perpetrated under his orders and in his interest in the congo state mr harris paused for a moment and then said that depends upon the action which the king takes upon the report of the commission which is now in his hands is that report published no said mr harris and it is a question whether it will ever be published greatly to our surprise the commission which every one expected would be a mere blind whose appointment was intended to throw dust in the eyes of the public turned out to be composed of highly respectable persons who heard the evidence most impartially refused no bona fide testimony produced by trustworthy witnesses and were overwhelmed by the multitudinous horrors brought before them and who we feel must have arrived at conclusions which necessitate an entire revolution in the administration of the congo are you quite sure mr harris i said that this is so yes said mr harris quite sure the commissioner impressed us all in the congo very favorably some of its members seem to us admirable specimens of public-spirited independent statesmen they realized that they were acting in a judicial capacity they knew that the eyes of europe were upon them and instead of making their inquiry a farce they made it a reality and their conclusions must be i feel sure so damning to the state that if king leopold were to take no action but to allow the whole infernal business to proceed unchecked any international tribunal which had powers of a criminal court would upon the evidence of the commission alone send those responsible to the gallows unfortunately i said at present the hague tribunal is not armed with the powers of an international assize court nor is it qualified to place offenders crowned or otherwise in the dock but don't you think that in the evolution of society the constitution of such a criminal court is a necessity it would be a great convenience at present said mr harris nor would you need one atom of evidence beyond the report of the commission to justify the hanging of whoever is responsible for the existence and continuance of such abominations has anybody seen the text of the report i asked as the commission returned to brussels in march some of the contents of that report are an open secret a great deal of the evidence has been published by the congo reform association in the congo the commissioners admitted two things first that the evidence was overwhelming as to the existence of the evils which had hitherto been denied and secondly that they vindicated the character of the missionaries they discovered as any one will who goes out to that country that it is the missionaries and the missionaries alone who constitute the permanent european element the congo state officials come out ignorant of the language knowing nothing of the country and with no other sense of their duties beyond that of supporting the concession companies in extorting rubber they are like men who are dumb and deaf and blind nor do they wish to be otherwise in two or three years they vanish giving place to other migrants as ignorant as themselves 
whereas the missionaries remain on the spot year after year they are in personal touch with the people whose language they speak whose customs they respect and whose lives they endeavor to defend to the best of their ability but mr harris i remarked was there not a certain mr grenfell a baptist missionary who has been all these years a convinced upholder of the congo state twas true said mr harris and pity tis twas true but tis no longer true mr grenfell has had his eyes opened at last and he has now taken his place among those who are convinced he could no longer resist the overwhelming evidence that has been brought against the congo administration Note. mr grenfell's station is in the lower congo a section remote from the vast rubber areas of the interior End of note. was the nature of the commissioner's report i resumed made known to the officials of the state before they left the congo to the head officials yes said mr harris with what result in the case of the highest official in the congo the man who corresponds in africa to lord curzon in india no sooner was he placed in possession of the conclusions of the commission than the appalling significance of their indictment convinced him that the game was up and he went into his room and cut his throat i was amazed on returning to europe to find how little the significance of this suicide was appreciated a paragraph in the newspaper announced the suicide of a congo official none of those who read that paragraph could realize the fact that that suicide had the same significance to the congo that the suicide let us say of lord milner would have had if it had taken place immediately on receiving the conclusions of a royal commission sent out to report upon his administration in south africa well if that be so mr harris i said and the governor-general cuts his throat rather than face the ordeal and disgrace of the exposure i am almost beginning to hope that we may see king leopold in the dock at the hague after all i will comment upon that mr harris said by quoting you mrs sheldon's remark made before myself and my colleagues messrs bond ellery ruskin walbaum and whiteside on may nineteenth last year when in answer to our question why should king leopold be afraid of submitting his case to the hague tribunal mrs sheldon answered men do not go to the gallows and put their heads in a noose if they can avoid it end of king leopold's soliloquy part two and end of anti-imperialist writings by mark twain read by john greenman